This is Lab Medicine Rounds, a curated podcast for physicians, laboratory professionals, and students. I'm your host, Justin Kreuter, the Bowtie Bandit of Blood, a transfusion medicine pathologist at Mayo Clinic. Today, we're rounding with Dr. Alan Klompas, Assistant Professor of Anesthesiology and Physician in the Department of Anesthesiology at Mayo Clinic to discuss transfusion support of ECMO patients. So thanks for joining us today, Dr. Klompas. Oh, Justin, thanks for having me. Yeah. Hey, I'm really curious, uh, you know, if you could kind of dive in. Uh, for our listeners, I want to give a little bit of a more of a preamble in that uh, Dr. Klompas has, has both trained uh, in transfusion medicine. He's completed a transfusion medicine fellowship, uh, and he also has completed a uh, cardiac uh, anesthesiology fellowship as well and, and is working on on that side of uh, the world right now. And so I thought he'd be a great person to, to take us into this topic. And let's dive into it first with, you know, why is transfusion support uh, an especially important component of patient care for these patients that are on ECMO support? So I think that's, first of all, that's a fantastic question. And I'd like to actually start by just, let's just define what ECMO is. Mm -hmm. So ECMO simply means extracorporeal membranous oxygenation, which is kind of a fancy phrase for saying that we're taking the patient's blood out of their body and using an oxygenator to take the, the, the role of their lungs. And it usually has a pump so that we're also kind of taking the role of their heart. So that's ECMO. Now there's a lot of different ways that ECMO can be configured. So cardiopulmonary bypass that we use for heart operations, that's technically ECMO because we're taking the patient's blood out of their body, oxygenating it and pumping it back in. But there's also all of these other different configurations we can do depending on where we take the blood from and where we give it back and what type of mechanical support it is. So we're talking specifically about ECMO here, but there are other types of supports that we use that are still mechanical devices. The big ones we would consider would be things like left ventricular assist devices or LVADs, which are much more common these days in the population, usually used for people who have long-term heart failure and will actually leave the hospital and be in the community with these LVADs. Balloon pumps or intra-aortic balloon pumps, and that's usually used in the cath lab or in the perioperative setting uh, in patients in the ICU or impellas, which is a tiny little screw type device that goes across the aortic valve in most settings. And that actually acts as a pump itself. It sounds like a lot of different devices, but one of the things that's common to them is that all of them interact with the human body and with blood in particular in kind of nasty ways. And they usually kind of chew up red blood cells, platelets, and tend to be predisposed to, to bleeding and clotting issues. So, so yeah, there's a lot so, of different types of support that people will need. So that really kind of, I love that you've, you've already kind of broadened us out a little bit, made us more sophisticated or made this conversation more sophisticated to understand that when I think about ECMO, really, I should be thinking about these different devices that are used. And as you're pointing out, several of these devices, they are... Um, they are consuming our, our patients' red blood cells. They are consuming our patients' platelets. And that's why transfusion support of these patients is, is still so important. Yeah. And so can you then take us into, are there, are there some principles that we um, can think about that'll help us better understand transfusion decisions in these patients? So first off, almost all of these patients are very sick. Uh, which makes sense. That's why they have a, a mechanical assistant type device that's helping them. So that often means multi-organ failure. And we have to incorporate all of these other organs into our decision-making into how we're going to target our blood transfusions. So I'm not necessarily just transfusing to keep a certain blood value at a certain level, but I need to make sure that I'm supplying oxygen and, uh, and waste clearance uh, to all of these different organs that are often very, very sick and in multi-organ failure. The other thing is most of these patients, when you put a plastic a piece of plastic or piece of metal into a blood vessel, it wants to clot as a foreign substance. So we often anticoagulate these patients. So the, the, there's a lot of nuance between how much is having too thin or how much is too thick in terms of the, the support. And it's very easy to go either side. And because these patients are so clinically dynamic, how they change so quickly, 
things can look good and you found the balance at one point and pretty soon you're clotting too much or bleeding too much. So we have to have a certain level of flexibility with how we react to the situation because they're often very dynamic. So in terms of the blood clotting and, and, and bleeding, that's one way that I think about it is really kind of looking at the patient to see what their clinical state is right now. The other thing, which I consider sort of a, I'm a physiologist by nature. And so I try to approach this from a physiologic perspective. So patients general, generally are using these types of mechanical supports because they, they lack oxygen delivery to their tissues. And either one of two things is going wrong here. Either they're not delivering enough oxygen to the tissues or the tissues are using more oxygen than they can deliver. So that's DO2 and VO2. And in general, I think of transfusion decisions in this population to be in kind of two realms. There's the yellow products to help control the bleeding. And then there's the red product, which is really for me to maximize their DO2 to VO2 ratios. And I try to uncouple that from the numbers as much as I possibly can, because sometimes the numbers will make us feel uncomfortable as blood bankers when we're transfusing somebody red cells with a hemoglobin of nine, but that may actually be what the right thing is if their DO2 is that much lower than their VO2, and I think that I'm outstripping their metabolic demand. So how do you think about those uh, topics? I think these are a couple of things that uh, we're not often talking about uh, DO2 and VO2 as often. I, I realize that, you know, when we open up some of our transfusion medicine textbooks, uh, you know, those, those um, topics are covered, but it, it's not so often that I hear that discussed, uh, you know, in the clinical, um, you know, office where we're interacting with clinicians, uh, talking with them. Uh, so how does, how does that figure into these decisions? Um, I mean, you kind of brought up the idea of how you're looking at the patient clinically, broadly speaking, but I don't know, maybe could you take us through maybe a specific situation that might help our listeners kind of get our hands around this a little bit from a practical standpoint? Sure. So I'll give you two extreme situations as examples. So DO2, just to remind people, is cardiac output or the blood that's being delivered multiplied by the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. So in some patients where we put them on a device, let's say an ECMO circuit, and we are delivering their blood at a set volume per minute, we're setting the cardiac output. So that means we are dependent on the oxygen carrying capacity to deliver a certain amount of oxygen. So I could give you two different scenarios. Let's say we have a patient with absolutely terrible sepsis and they're hypermetabolic and they're consuming a huge amount of oxygen because their tissues are so revved up. If I can't get their cardiac output higher anymore, my only option is I either I need to try to turn down their oxygen consumption by using agents like muscle relaxants or basically things I can control temperature. So sometimes therapeutically cool them so that I decrease that VO2, that oxygen consumption. And if I can't do that, like in someone who's very septic, my only option is to push up the DO2. But if their cardiac output is already sort of maximized, my only option then is to supplement the oxygen carrying capacity. So that's where in those certain circumstances that aren't very common per se, but when I'm in that circumstance, what I really need to do is push up the DO2. And that means I may need to transfuse to a number that inherently makes me uncomfortable, but it's actually the right thing to do for that particular patient. I love that example. So I, I was one class shy of a math minor back in the day. And, and as I hear you talking there, it, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm comfortable in that. It really kind of sets me at ease. That kind of helps me see, you know, that we can be very pragmatic about this. When we're thinking about somebody clinically, that isn't like the wild, wild west necessarily. Uh, you know, we do have uh, mathematical formulas talking about how we derive DO2 and we understand what these variables are. And so we just need to, we can concentrate or focus our thinking down to what are these variables and pragmatically, how am I going to uh, take care of this patient? And in general, I would say that's right. And I'm obviously oversimplifying an incredibly complex physiology. But 
in general, that's how I'm trying to think about it. When you're trying to make very rapid fire decisions to a patient who really isn't doing very well, and you often don't have a lot of time to sort of parse out the nuances, some of the ways that we think about it in terms of making a therapeutic decision are kind of thinking about it in this way. I should note though that this is a very rare subset of patients. So your average critical care patient is going to fit into those, you know, the, the old dogmas that we've all looked at and, and have been studied for many years that we probably don't need to overtransfuse a lot of these patients and, and restrictive transfusion practices are in general a good thing. But in these rare circumstances, it's one way that we can sort of apply the patient's physiology at the time and watching how dynamic it is, it's behaving and sort of make decisions above the level of those big RCTs. I love that because right there you're kind of highlighting the fact that, you know, we do have uh, guidelines out there and at the same time we need to be making, you know, individualize uh, some of these for our patients. And, and so then that, you know, now, I, you know, riddle me this. <laughs> so what you've talked about there is a very, uh, you know, clinician bedside perspective for individualizing patients. So how can laboratory professionals contribute you know, add value to the clinical care of these patients? So having a, a bit of a foot in both camps now, I can tell you that um, it's gonna be no, no surprise to lab professionals that there isn't exactly a lot of education in lab medicine in a lot of residencies and a lot of clinical, people who spend most of their time at bedsides. And so the, th the biggest thing that lab medicine has provided me and I think it, we can leverage is the ability to understand these lab practices that we rely on every single day to make these decisions. The difficulty, I think, is that uh, we all sort of know from experience and kind of from our apprenticeship that we know roughly how to use each, you know, each of these numbers and each lab, and particularly when you get into coagulation where things get really into the weeds, we all kind of know this feel of this is the right thing I should do with this circumstance. However, again, lab professionals know that there's a lot more nuance to that and understanding how the tests work and the pre and post test probability and all of these things that go into it will actually completely change your interpretation and therefore change your management. So one of the things that I think is, is extremely helpful and I actually rely on, on my colleagues all the time, I've called, uh, I've called Justin many times to discuss this stuff, is how to interpret some of these very complicated tests in very complicated situations. And I think that's the tricky part. It's sometimes we understand the tests when it's a normal person, when you're looking at a PTI and R and a patient coming in on warfarin, that's one thing. When you're looking at a PTI and R and someone who's in hemorrhagic shock with five organ failure, that's a completely different beast. So I think laboratory professionals are really ideally suited to help us understand that and contextualize our responses. You know, that kind of brings me to this, this kind of uh, connection between, you know, laboratory medicine and, and bedside uh, clinical care, you know, you, you're bringing up this, you know, the interpretation may change, right? And, and by that virtue of the interpretation changing, that changing your clinical management for a patient. Uh, and so, you know, how can we improve that interaction? Because I imagine, you know, one of the things that we see is, uh, you know, that takes somebody realizing they need uh, either that it takes, you know, you as a bedside physician realizing, you know, I, I need help, I need to phone a friend and, and, mm -hmm. and picking up the phone and, and calling someone like myself, or it takes somebody like me sort of saying, uh, you know, I think Alan might, might be, uh, you know, need a little help here and, and pick up the phone. It can go both directions. And I know you've been on the both sides of that, of that telephone. And so I'm curious about your, your perspective of how we can do that better. So I think there's a few different ways to do this. The first I think is it's all about relationships. So when you have an established relationship with a colleague, I think it makes that conversation a whole lot easier to do. So you and I know each other very well and I don't even hesitate when I have a question about something and I pick up the phone. If you don't know who your clinical pathologist is or your transfusion doc is, that's a, a level of, of, of energy that's a barrier. It's just gonna be so much harder to do when you actually need it. So making both of us more visible and actually engaging when we don't have these clinical you know, conundrums, that's actually a really good thing in my mind. The other thing is understanding the, the time component of this. So 
often when you're hearing, particularly in ECMO or mechanical circulatory support type situation, when you're interacting with a lab professional and a clinician, it, it's usually a pretty tense moment. And sometimes there are, there's a time for nuance and there's sometimes not time for that nuance. So it may not be the best you know, time to start really strengthening some of those relationships and discussing the finer points when a patient is actually not doing so well. And so sometimes I guess we need to find a way to get through, get through the initial periods so that we support the patient through that. And then we can sort of discuss some of those finer points later. And like you said, I have been that person on both sides of that. And that's a really fine balance and a tricky thing to do. The other thing I can say, again, as being on both sides of it is as a clinician, usually you're falling back into what you know. And if you have a clinical situation that's not looking so hot, you're sort of, you're going to do what you normally want to do because that's what's worked for you in the past. And it isn't always the right move. And I think that's where lab medicine, particularly transfusion medicine, can sometimes call and say, are you sure you really need this right now? And if you're going to say no, the thing that really helps me is when it's, when you get that no, but here's what I can offer for you instead. Because I think that people don't want to feel stranded, no matter who you are on what side, they don't want to feel abandoned in the middle of a big situation. So something that we can both do for each other is make sure that we're supporting each other by, if I can't give you what you want, here's the old switcheroo, and I'll give you something instead that might help you out if I don't have that extra playbook. So those are kind of three things to me that I think might be able to strengthen some of these relationships um, and something we can work on even when we're not in, you know, in a dire situation. Yeah, it, something I wanted to just uh, highlight for our listeners is that sometimes maybe it's difficult to tell, right? If it's if it's one of these moments where uh, you know we just need the answer and and move on in our life, or if there's time to understand the background a little bit further. And actually, I was called by uh, one of Alan's uh, colleagues uh, last week, and um, it was actually the first time I had interacted with this person, and so I, I didn't have a good read for kind of how that conversation was. I gave gave my answer. And, and then I specifically asked, you know, <laughs> do you have time for the explanation for why or, or do you need to run? Uh, right. And so uh, sometimes it might feel it's probably better to ask rather than just assume if you don't have necessarily a good read. And I, I think you absolutely nailed it there. Unfortunately, not everyone is going to be as open to some of those discussions. And some people sort of, you know, they, they want it because they ordered it, they wanted it, and that's just the way it is. But I think realistically, the best way forward so that we're all sort of improving each other's practice is that, like you said, we have that discussion. And I think a great way, like you said, is ask, is now a good time to have this detailed discussion? Or should I call you back in a couple hours once you kind of get things tucked in there? Um, you know, I, I love that idea. I love that approach. Yeah. So Thank you so much. We've been rounding with Dr. Alan Klompis uh, about the important role of transfusion support of, originally we were talking about ECMO patients, but <laughs> Dr. Klompis, what are the, the different devices we need to keep in mind? So I would put them all in the category of mechanical circulatory support devices. And the big ones you're likely to see would be ECMO, Impellas, LVADs or RVADs, and uh, intra-aortic balloon pumps. Thank you for taking the time to discuss this topic with us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And, and shout out to uh, Dr. Moor, uh, Noor al uh, She uh, suggested this topic for us. And uh, thank you listeners to joining us today. We invite you to share your thoughts and suggestions via email. Please direct any suggestions to mcleducation at mayo.edu and reference this podcast. If you've enjoyed Lab Medicine Rounds podcast, please subscribe. Until our next rounds together, we encourage you to continue to connect lab medicine and the clinical practice through insightful conversations.